welcome to this session of Right Around the Murray. My name is Jason Steger. I edit the books pages of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. And in this session, I'm going to be talking to Kate Grenville about her new novel, A Room Made of Leaves. First of all, though, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the Right Around the Murray Festival in Albury is on Wiradjuri country, and I'd like to pay my respects uh, to their elders past and present. I'm speaking to you today uh, from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present as well. It remains Aboriginal land. Kate Grenville is um, an, a, a much admired and acclaimed uh, Australian author. She's written 16 books um, that include short stories, novels, memoirs, uh, biography, um, her new novel, though, um, which is in effect the fourth in a quartet of novels about colonial Australia, focuses on the figure of Elizabeth MacArthur. And um, Kate uh, constructs the book as uh, she as as the author, and she is also the editor of um, a manuscript that has been discovered, a manuscript written by Elizabeth MacArthur, who was, of course, the uh, wife of John MacArthur, who has been credited with founding the, the Australian uh, wool industry. But of course, um, Elizabeth MacArthur's story and her memoir tells, tells, gives us a very, very different version of, of history. So um, please welcome Kate Grenville. Thank you very much, Jason. And I'd like to acknowledge the elders of the Wurundjeri uh, people on whose land of the Kulin Nation on whose land I'm also sitting. Stories have been told on this particular bit of land beside the Merry Creek, I imagine for many millennia, and I'm honoured to be part of that tradition. Well said. Um, of course, before, I, before we start, Kate, I should mention, and which I forgot to mention in the lead up to this, that um, uh, viewers can ask questions um, during, during the uh, session, and um, there, there will be a session, that, uh, there'll be 15 minutes at the end of our conversation uh, when um, the audience's questions will be put to you. Uh, but Kate, um, let's start with uh, Elizabeth MacArthur. Um, I wondered why, why you chose her for your return to fiction, because this is your first novel for nearly 10 years. And what, what it was that appealed to you about her character. Look, it's odd because I had grown up learning about Elizabeth MacArthur and thinking how boring she, she was because that was how we were taught about Elizabeth MacArthur. Her husband was fairly boring. Being the father of the wool industry uh, does not make the heart race for, you know, a child in primary school. Um, and his wife was portrayed as this kind of devout, devoted uh, helpmate, you know, the perfect wife, basically, supporting her husband in all his endeavours and looking after the family farm when he was away. So mm. I never, it never crossed my mind that I would write a book about her until I was doing deep background research for The Secret River, which is a book mm -hmm. that I wrote in 2005 about, um, partly based on my ancestor, uh, who was a convict who came out and, you know, did various things very early on in Sydney. Um, and in the course of doing that, I read some of her letters. And by then I knew a bit about what Sydney was like in 1790, which is when the MacArthur's arrived. And mm. the difference between her bland, impersonal, Pollyanna-ish, goody gumboil letters and the tumultuous, violent, squalid reality of what her life must have been, um, it showed that those two things together did not fit. They were not congruent. Mm. There was a gap mm. between them. And a gap, of course, is what a novelist loves. And that's when I started to borrow, borrow a little bit more deeply and see that, in fact, in my view, Elizabeth MacArthur's bland, boring letters were, in fact, the fiction that she wrote mm -hmm. about her life to leave as a record. And I thought, well, I will be bold enough to write the non-fiction book. I will write her real memoirs where she actually spills the beans about what yeah. it was really like. It's a lovely uh, narrative device, that, isn't it? To just pretend to discover discover um, a <laughs> memoir or, or, or documents or whatever. 
Well, you know, it's the oldest trick in the novelist's book. I mean, I, I think that I'm right in saying that uh, Robinson Crusoe, which is usually credited as one of the very first novels ever written, uh, mm. was pretend, pretended to be uh, the account found in a floating bottle of, you know, Robinson mm. Crusoe's um, 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 adventures on the island. So it's a very old and honourable tradition. And I don't know why it took me 20 years to think of it, frankly. It seemed so obvious <laughs> once I stumbled on it. <laughs> But you, you, you mentioned there um, the gap between the, the perceived reality and, 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 and something else. Um, and that, as you say, is, is where the novelist comes in. Um, you, 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 uh, the novelist, um, and particularly a novelist uh, writing what could be loosely termed a historical novel, but um, uh, that's where you can play, isn't it? That's right. Um, I usually resist the term historical novel because mm. for me, I don't actually enjoy reading historical fiction. For me, it always has a kind of uh, rather la rather laborious, research-heavy, rather clunky feeling. And also I feel, where does the history end and the fiction begin? That idea always uh, worries me when I'm reading mm -hmm. historical fiction. So I prefer to say that I write um, fiction that is set in the past because my books are really about today. I am interested in the past, but I'm much more interested in today. And my my feeling as a writer is that our, our today, obviously, is shaped by our yesterday. So the more mm -hmm. we can understand our yesterday, that is the point of knowing about yesterday so that we can try and avoid some of the mistakes uh, in the decisions we're making today. Which I suppose is, and but that does relate to history in the sense that that's why people study history, isn't it? So that they, to avoid those mistakes. But so going back to Elizabeth MacArthur though, how did you go about creating her character? Did you think then, I mean, I, I, I noticed that in, um, when Jim, Jill Kerr Conway wrote um, the entry in, in the dictionary of biography about her, she described her, her novels, as sh her letters as showing an acute feminine intelligence, which is sort of, slightly um, contradicted by what you say um, and so uh, how do, uh, did you did you feel that you had a, a sort of free reign to to make her make her what you what you felt like uh, yes i did although i also did a lot of research that to me ran against some of the received wisdom about elizabeth mm -hmm. macarthur and that in fact took me to the deep underlying theme of the book which, which is not so much, I mean, of course, it's about Elizabeth MacArthur, but it is really about the idea of deconstructing things that we think we know. You know, mm -hmm. at one point somebody uh, says in this book, how do, we know, how do we know what we think we know? You know, what input has gone into it to make us make up our mind about, for example, whether Daniel Andrews is doing a good job? What are we reading to arrive at that, yes. at that yes. opinion, whichever it is? Um, so that's why for a long time this book was called Do Not Believe Too Quickly. Mm. So I thought about, um, yes, Jill, Jill Kerr Conway talking about feminine intelligence. Now, that word feminine immediately rings all kinds of bells for me. Mm. What exactly mm -hmm. does she mean by that? I think she probably means, well, I won't, I won't presume to say what Jill Kerr Conway might have meant. Look, I looked at Elizabeth's life. I looked at her letters, which certainly are very um, occasionally, I mean, they are mostly quite bland. But now and again, there is a little shaft of somebody witty, ironic, um, mm -hmm. self-aware. Uh, and those gave me hope that actually my idea about Elizabeth MacArthur was in fact true that she was, in fact, much more than she appeared, much more interesting than the woman I had been uh, taught about at school. As for whether I had a right to, um, yes, this is a novel. No, yeah. one, no one should ever mistake it for history. Unfortunately, though, the only things we know about Elizabeth MacArthur are what she wrote in her letters and what she wrote in a very fragmentary journal of her journey to Australia and the very, very, very few things that other people wrote about her. Now, that mm. leaves her in a vacuum. We're never going to know about her if we're going to stick to uh, those sources. 
So we either plunge into the unknown and say, well, this is a very plausible, an entirely plausible version of this woman, uh, or we go on knowing nothing about her except this boring, and it's not, the problem is not that it's a boring stereotype, it's that it, I think, fails to honour a woman who must have been absolutely remarkable, and moreover, she represents all the women of the past who have been rendered voiceless by the misogynistic societies they lived in, those mm. women should be honoured and rescued from that silence. Mm. Their true voices should be allowed to speak, even if it's not really their true voices, but an approximation of it. Mm. And so when you, when you um, read the letters, I'm right in thinking, you uh, came across a particular phrase that, um, that sort of sent you off um, more, more seriously, considering her as, as, as a subject. Uh, as a character, as a main character, in in the same way that when you wrote um, the Secret River, um, you came across a phrase about um, your ancestor. He took up land, mm -hmm. and and that sort of begged masses of questions, didn't it? How he took up land, and uh, but there was a phrase, uh, there was a phrase that Elizabeth wrote um, that that sparked your 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 attention. That's right. I was I was going through a book actually by by um, um, not Flannery O'Connor, Tim Flannery, uh, about mm. early Sydney. It's a little extract from various people's letters and so on. Mm. And one of the ones he chooses to, and it's where I I sat up straight and the hair stood up on my on on, the, on my spine or whatever they're supposed to do. Um, <laughs> in the midst of this, these letters of hers, which are impersonal. That's the striking thing about not only Elizabeth MacArthur's letters, but most of the letters of those women of that time. Their letters were not, they had no sense of a person behind them. They were very correct. They were self-censoring themselves because they had to. Letters were public documents, so they had to be mm. careful. So in the middle of this kind of bloodless stuff of Elizabeth MacArthur's, Suddenly there's an account of her asking for some lessons in astronomy from the uh, colonist astronomer William Dawes, who I had, of course, already written about and got to know very well in writing a book that I called The Lieutenant. Mm. So William Dawes gave her a few lessons in astronomy and she writes to a friend in England, I had the lessons from Mr Dawes. Oh, I might, I might add that uh, William Dawes was a few years older than her and William Dawes has fascinated people ever since. There's clearly something about William Dawes as he has come down to us in history that really is very attractive to people. And I don't mean necessarily physically, but there's something very intriguing and attractive about his personality. Mm. Uh, so that's the context in which Elizabeth MacArthur writes to her friend, I had the lessons in astronomy. I mistook my abilities, meaning astronomy is a bit hard, which it is. And then she says, I blush at my error. And suddenly, I was reading this book and suddenly Elizabeth MacArthur is there before me as a living, breathing woman full of blood and the blood is pounding up to her cheeks. Now, we all know why we blush. It's because we're emotionally involved in some yeah. way or another. Yeah. And in yeah. this case, of course, I thought, you know, the novel novelist immediately <laughs> leaps to a conclusion, ah, she's got the hots for William Dawes. So that's <laughs> That's really yeah. what kept me going for this with this book. When I yeah. when I thought, oh no, this is just not working, I went back to yeah. that and I thought, no, no, there is a there is a powerful story to tell here, and I'm going to tell mm -hmm. it. It's that classic "what if," isn't it? Yeah, exactly. What which happened is, after which, Mrs. MacArthur blushed? <laughs> yeah, which is which is sort of the basis of all all, all fiction, isn't it? I guess um, it is. And of course, the other thing is that her marriage was was pretty miserable because John MacArthur. He was, a, he was no doubt a complex man, and I have made him a complex man and not a monster, um, but he can't have been an easy husband, let's put it that way. Their mm. marriage was almost certainly a marriage of necessity. It was almost certainly a shotgun wedding, not based on love, and it certainly won't, wasn't based on any of the Jane Austen prerequisites of money or class or status mm. because he was the son of a draper, although he mm. loved later to put it about that he was aristocratic. He was not. He was the son of a draper. So, you know, her marriage, I think, was probably lacking in some of the things that um, we all look for in a human relationship. And in my version, she found it with William Dawes. That may or may mm. not have been true, but it's certainly not impossible. Mm. Mm. So when you um, when you write about 
characters who existed and you're you're putting them in the context of real events and everything what um what is your responsibility what are your responsibilities to history and to and to those real characters can you simply um well can you do what you want in effect i mean i accepting the fact that it is fiction everybody has to you know any reader must realize that this is a novel and um, but so what uh, when you write it do you have a a sense of responsibility lurking in, in the background Oh, look, it's very much for, forefronted, uh, for, foregrounded. It's not lurking in the background. I have a very strong sense of responsibility because I'm well aware that although it may be fiction, it is probably, um, you know, reading real history is not everybody's cup of tea. And so it may well be that my version of Elizabeth MacArthur uh, is more, becomes people's idea, many people's idea of Elizabeth MacArthur. That is a big responsibility. I'm not in the business of just making things up. So uh, I think every uh, writer of, um, let's say, historical fiction uh, has their own kind of parameters. Now, mine is to take, to take, to do my, to do my homework and find out all that is known in the historical record, and never to, never to invent something that simply could not have happened, never the impossible. So I always, I always look for the moments in that historical record where there is a bit of a puzzle, there is a bit of a question, and I think to myself, well, what is the most, I think it's called um, Occam's Razor, isn't it? You go for the mm. most, the simplest and most plausible explanation. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. I, I use the historical resources. I go back to the primary sources. I, I do, of course, read the secondary ones, but um, mm. only after I've made up my own mind, really. Yeah. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the libraries d deciphering 18th century handwriting. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that must be pretty difficult. <laughs> it is difficult, particularly when Elizabeth MacArthur used to cross-write her letters because you paid for postage on the basis of how many pages you wrote on. So you'd write one way and then you'd turn the page at right angles and write across it. So that's really hard to read. Anyway, I did all that. It took me months. Um, so within that Within that parameter, I then think, okay, here are these, let's call them facts. Mm. How do I explain these facts? What scenario can I draw? What stuff can I put between these two facts that is very plausible, both in terms of the history and in terms of what I know about human nature? What is the plausible explanation here? And I find that very freeing. I've actually, when, when I look back at all my novels, I don't think a single one of them is simply made up. I, mm. I seem to need that bed of um, data or fact of some kind that somehow frees me from the need to invent a whole story. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I find myself really stimulated by looking at historical resources, mm. resources mm. and uh, asking myself, yes, but what, really, what, what, what were they really like and what really yeah. happened? I mean, I, you do say, don't you, um, in, in at the very beginning that I think it's, you say it at the very beginning. Um, uh, real events have become um, a little slithery in my hands, <laughs> which I thought, or is that at the, at the, is that in your author's note at the end? That's um, in the author's yeah, note yeah, at the end. Yeah, the yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a wonderful description of, of <laughs> what a novel, what a novelist does with with facts. <laughs> Yes, and of course, in that in that note at the end, I do mm. confess to the there is only oh there are a couple of points when I have actually uh, gone against the uh, kind of actual dates and facts, and one mm -hmm. of them is that I've combined two uh, governors, Hunter mm -hmm. and King. I've combined them into one, um, and that's because and I've admitted to that in that mm. note at the end because it's quite a big thing to do and it cuts against my my conviction that I should really stick to the, you know, the, the reality. But mm. the problem is that Hunter and King, in terms of the MacArthur's, uh, they had the same effect on the MacArthur's. And to go through the whole business of doing twice would, if mm. it, I actually wrote it, but it felt very re repetitious. So mm. at about draft 28, I think, I made the, the quite, for me, quite confronting decision 
to combine these two people and give them a nickname so I didn't have to kind of, uh, you know, fudge fudge that bit. Hmm. They draft were both... 28. Oh, look, it was wow. draft... The last, the last draft was actually draft 34, which makes it sound worse than it is. It makes me sound stupider than I really am, stupid though I may be. Because <laughs> um, a lot of those drafts, what happens is that I... I print it out, I do it on, you know, I do the first draft by hand. Mm -hmm. After that, I put it into the computer and I then make handwritten corrections on the mm -hmm. printout. And there's a point mm -hmm. when the printout becomes impossible to read. And that's when I print it out again and call it draft whatever the next one is. So it's not quite as, yeah, it does sound mm -hmm. a bit OCD, doesn't it? 34 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, the 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 I the notion I mean the the reality of of women's across history of women's stories not being heard, I mean that's something you have written about uh, going back to Joan Makes History. And it seems to be a consistent interest of yours. Yes, in fact, it even goes back. It it actually goes right back to my very first book. I think the book of short stories called Bearded Ladies, yes. Lillian's mm -hmm. story. They're yeah. all trying to give voice to a section of humanity that was either voiceless uh, as the women of the past or they have a, mm. a voice that was necessarily distorted. It was mm. partial. It was self-censored in some way or another. So it is a, it is a preoccupation. Not that I've ever, mm. you know, you realise these things in retrospect. If when I was, um, I don't know, 24 and starting to write, I had thought, right, I'm going to spend my career writing about, you know, giving voice to women. And, of course, The Secret River, I suppose, is the big exception to that because that's... Um, uh, and, of course, Dark Places, they're both mm. more of the point of view of a man. Yeah. Um, but because there's a, there's a moment when um, early on you, you, um, Elizabeth says, how can there be the history... Beyond the the watertight and trim lies another, just as watertight, just as trim. And that's, um, that seems to me to be, um, you know, make, make this add to the utter sort of convincing nature of, of, of your story. Because it's all so plausible, isn't it? <laughs> and the fact that she admits that this is only... And at one point, actually, I have Elizabeth MacArthur saying, and, of course, you have only my own word for this. this yeah. You think this is my memoirs, but this may all be the invention of a sly old woman, which was a line, <laughs> that, yeah. which was a line that I found very amusing to write. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, that notion of the history, the reality, mm. is probably the most important thing of our moment in history, it seems to me. And the pandemic has amplified that sense that we are saturated in misinformation mm. and the big puzzle, the huge puzzle, which is harder every day to, to solve, is where to get proper information that is not polemic. Everything wants to persuade you of something one way or another. Mm. And, in mm. fact, reality is never... Uh, one thing or the other. It's always a complicated muddle of something in the middle. So that's the sense in which this book is profoundly about today, um, a time of toxic misinformation that looks entirely convincing, as really any story can if it's put, mm, mm. put well enough. I mean, you know, we all saw, uh, to go a little further from home, from Dan Andrews, um, uh, uh, we all saw Trump standing up saying, um, I don't for a moment want to compare Dan Andrews. This is why I'm stumbling here. I'm a great <laughs> admirer. I'm a great admirer of Dan Andrews. I, in fact, wrote him a fan letter last night. So having said that, I can now move on to Trump without anybody <laughs> thinking that I'm equating Dan Andrews with Trump. But, you know, we all saw Trump standing up and saying, look, if bleach kills this, why don't we all just drink bleach? And there's a moment, there's a moment when even... You know, intelligent people think, oh, gee, maybe he's right, because he put it quite convincingly. And, you know, the, the rationality swings in in a moment, and you yeah. suppose you know, that's absolute nonsense. But you know what I mean? Clearly for mm. that moment, he totally believed it. It was yeah. totally plausible to him. And yeah. that's what's so dangerous about a particularly simple truth, simple things that appear to be true. The simpler it is, 
some wonderful person said this in a fabulous quote that I've now forgotten, but basically what they were saying is, if it seems really simple, it's almost certainly not true. So that's that's the other thing that spurred me on in writing this book, because between uh, t- about 2000 and last year, yeah. when I finished it, the world became more and more a place of people believing crazy ideas, dangerously crazy. And, of course, the internet, Mm -hmm. let's not even go there, but, you know, social media amplifies the echo chamber. We all know that stuff. And yet, you know, I read the papers uh, and even though I disagree with a great deal that they say, I know that I have to work quite hard not to be convinced by it. You see it in writing. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, yes, maybe that's true after all. Mm-hmm. Well, in the end, as you say, you, you sort of have to decide, don't you? You have to come down one way or another, I suppose. Well, maybe you have to do something a little bit more difficult, which is to live with a certain degree of uncertainty. Um, mm. That's very good. See, I'd, I'd rewrite that sentence if I had a chance. <laughs> draft two of that sentence. <laughs> um, <laughs> because uh, you have to do your homework and you have to read the people you don't agree with more than the people you agree with. The people you don't agree with will teach you much more and will show Mm. you much more what the truth is likely to be than the people who agree with you. But, of course, you know, psychologists have a word for it, confirmation bias. We hate Mm. reading stuff we don't agree with already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have to think. think. It's a nightmare time for a classic small-L liberal, really. It is. It is. um, But uh, talking about Trump, of course... um, Oh, let's uh, not... (laughs) <laughs> but but no, but your your um your creation of John MacArthur, uh, there were moments when I thought, well, this guy is is like Trump. He is a narcissist. He he will not accept um, things that are presented to him. He'll come up with a, a scheme and then sort of somebody might nudge him in a different direction and he'll drop it without even mentioning mentioning the scheme later on. Um, was was did Trump figure in your thinking when you were writing about MacArthur? Look, you know, I have been writing this book for ten years, yeah. um, and of course, Trump wasn't even a, a, a flicker on the horizon when I started it. Mm. But you know, one of the spooky things about writing novels, you have to be very careful who you invent, because that's not the only moment in my life where I have appeared to bring somebody into existence by writing about them. So there are certain Mm. things I would never write about in case I make them happen. (laughs) Look, uh, beyond that, not really. I mean, Trump is, uh, who knows what Trump really is, but John MacArthur was actually a more interesting, um, he was a a narcissist, he was a wounded narcissist, and I think maybe Mm. that's the difference between him and Trump. My version of John MacArthur is quite a complex man who was damaged in childhood, as I think. Mm-hmm. You know, many many people who grow up to be difficult were, in particular ways, that made him armoured and guarded and needing to win at all costs. In a way that mm. you know you don't have to go as far as Trump to look to to, to find sure. that. Sure. Um, but I've also given him uh, moments of softness that his wife sees, and he immediately smothers them. But they mm. are there. He is a human being, whereas. You know, you look at Trump and you do wonder whether that mask ever slips, even for a moment, mm-hmm. what really is in there, if anything. Mm-hmm. And the other, the other important element of the book is the relationship between um, the colonial settlers and the indigenous population. And um, I think um, um, that... Uh, you say later in the book, uh, I mean, I, I think Elizabeth encounters through uh, Dawes um, initially the, the indigenous population, but she in- increasingly becomes aware of the, the, the nature of the relationship between the settlers and the population. And there is, of course, um, an act of violence towards the end of the book that she very, very subtly discovers the truth about because her husband is trying to conceal it from her. Um, I think that um, at one stage, um, 
she says, and I'm just going to read this, it is the first thing, the first hard truth without which no repair can ever be hoped for. Um, and that is, I felt that was a very strong message of this book, a very strong message in which you would, were portraying a problem from the past that needs to be addressed in the present. Absolutely. That's, uh, you've, you've hit the nail right on the head. Uh, again, it's, it, it's about the past, but it's about the future much more. And we now, as you know, settler Australians, when I say we, I'm, I'm thinking of myself and my lot, settler Australians, mm. uh, we have unfinished business, we have unexplored business. And um, the MacArthur's, of course, were the first people to steal a particular 100 acres from the Barramatical people. So they were mm -hmm. one tiny microcosm of what happened, uh, what has happened all over Australia, complete dispossession mm. uh, of the Indigenous people. So they were the first people to do that. And I obviously could, couldn't, didn't want to tell this story without addressing that, that overwhelmingly important fact uh, that, you know, Settlers, settlers dispossessed, as you say, it, it was never mm. ceded, remains mm. Aboriginal land. Uh, so what do I do with that? Well, in The Secret River, I had talked about and tried to explore what actually happened, what it was actually like, how it came about that one set of people felt entitled to take, mm. to take land from another, to dispossess another set of people. So I didn't want to tell that story again. I felt I had kind of made my, you know, said all I could say there. But what I realised is that there's another dimension to it because after the taking is the story of the taking. So mm. for the last 250 years, settler Australians have been telling each other stories about how it was okay that we did this. You know, in the old days it was, oh, well, they were just nomads. You know, they didn't use the land. We had every mm. right to take it. Um, Keith Winshuttle back in the history wars in the early 2000s said, oh, we didn't do anything wrong. It's just they had no immunity to smallpox or um, uh, measles. They all just died. Mm. It was going to be sad, mm. but it wasn't our fault. No massacres happened. Oh, dearie me, no. So I thought, <laughs> okay, this is my chance um, to investigate a little tiny bit of um, the fact that history is told by the victors and theirs is the only story that remains. And that's particularly so when, in this case, the Indigenous story of all that that happened would have been only oral history and we mm. did so much damage to the sort of uh, continuity of oral history that uh, many of those stories are now lost. That means the dominant history is the settler one or the colonial yeah. one. So I've taken a particular moment in Sydney history which has become known as the Battle of Parramatta, although it really wasn't a battle, um, on, and when I discovered that John MacArthur was the person in charge of that bit of military act, activity, I, I realised that the, the version of it that has come down to us is almost certainly not true. Uh, it was probably set, a, set about by John MacArthur. Mm. This is my own theory about this. Um, and we will now never know what the truth was, but it almost certainly isn't the story that we've been believing for the last 200 years. Mm. So that seems quite an important emblem or, or example of what we should do about deconstructing yeah. the stories that come down to us and uh, asking a few hard questions about them. Mm. And yes, Elizabeth mm. MacArthur at the end has come to that point where I think we, we need to be as, as white people in this country of saying, look, we have to acknowledge what we did truthfully. Yeah. And um, that doesn't in itself help anything, but it is the essential door through which one can then go into some kind of future. Yeah, because in the, in the book she is she is critical of her husband, not directly, but in her writing, for not using the word war, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't she? She's, and then, but I thought that um, you then, it's interesting because she is, she ends up in a dilemma because she feels that she, towards the end of her life, that she belongs, she belongs on that land in Parramatta. And, and um, you, you, you write, um, it, was not my, it was not flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Devon was the land that held the bodies of every man and woman whose couplings had ended in me. 
the place where my forebears had lain in the churchyard at Bridgewell for so many years that the words on their gravestones have blurred. Yet I belonged here now better than I belonged to any other sliver of the globe's mighty bulk. So she has that terrible, she knows that the settlers have stolen the land and yet she feels a deep attachment to the land. Yes. That's a very moving, that's a very moving um, situation that you place her in. And I think it's the situation of many of us settler Australians mm. descended from those. I mean, that's precisely how I feel. Elizabeth MacArthur could in fact have got on a boat, although she never did. She could have easily mm. gone back to England for a visit and never did. Mm. Well, not easily, but she could have. Um, whereas for my lot, you know, it's five generations that my ancestor Solomon Wiseman came here. So there is nowhere for me to go back to. No. I'm here willy-nilly. Mm. So when Elizabeth MacArthur says that, it's like here is the first generation of white Australians for whom that was true, this place is home. Mm. But it's the question we have to ask as white Australians today uh, you know how do we how 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 do we how do we meet that history in a kind of um, in a way that gives us some way forward in some kind of honourable attempt to share it, which we which we haven't until until now done. So what what would you like to see, Kate? I mean, you've written a lot about this. What would yes. you like to see? Uh, look, I don't have any answers i'm afraid <laughs> except that i think actually we're still at the point where many people still don't realize that um that something has to be done and maybe maybe what we really have to do maybe the first step having acknowledged the past truthfully and i think many australians still haven't done that mm. the next step after that is i think to do a lot of listening rather than mm. a lot of problem solving and a lot of talking and I think that's the thing that we haven't done. So when I say I don't actually know where we go from here, it's partly because we haven't done enough listening. I mean, the statement from the heart, the Uluru statement from the mm. heart, sits there unacted on. So that would seem to me uh, one of the next steps one might yes. take. Mm. Mm. Let's go back to fiction um, and your your... Elizabeth, when she's writing, uh, there's a moment when she talks about discovering her voice, um, her writing voice. And I wondered when, when did you discover your writing voice? Um, do you mean for this book or in my life, in my long life? Well, both, both when you started writing, when you felt that sort of a moment of confidence about writing and also with this book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, my first um, confidence about writing, actually, that goes back a long way. I wasn't very, I wasn't particularly good at any subjects in primary school except the subject that I think was called composition. And the day that <laughs> I remember that <laughs> <laughs> we were invited to write, uh, we were invited to write uh, a composition over two weeks uh, or maybe two days. So the first day we had to you know, produce uh, a, a kind of a problem, really. And the yeah. second day we had to write the end of it, get them out of the problem. And I wrote, a, I wrote a story called Trapped by the Tide, heavily influenced by Enid Blyton and all the books that I was <laughs> reading about English cliffs. Now that I've seen yeah. English cliffs, I realise how you could be trapped by the tide. Yeah. In Australia, it's not quite so easy. We have different kind of cliffs. <laughs> Anyway, I wrote Trapped by the Tide and it so impressed my third grade teacher that she got me to stand up the front of the class and read it out and she wrote on the blackboard some of the interesting words that I had used. <laughs> and I think at that moment, <laughs> that kind of little, little flame in me, I think, um, <laughs> not that... <laughs> It's a pretty <laughs> terrible piece of writing. I've actually still got it. But anyway, oh, really? <laughs> there it is, yes. Um, yeah, and then when I was, <laughs> well, it it meant a lot to me because I didn't get that much praise in primary school or in high school for that matter. But anyway, it it went to my head a bit, I think. Um, but after I I did a, a you know arts degree at Sydney Uni. Mm. But after that, I went into the film in, film business. I, I went into mm. um, editing documentary films at a place called mm. Film Australia. Mm. 
Mm. And that was an amazing way of making stories. And I can see absolutely that that's how I became a writer. Because you had these hundreds and hundreds of hours or dozens of hours of rushes. And you mm -hmm. had to, and, there, and it was not scripted because it was a documentary. So as the editor, you had to find the story. You had to find, you had to put things together in a plausible way to find mm. a narrative in a chunk of life that didn't actually have a narrative. And that's essentially my writing process now. Um, as for finding voice, it's interesting. I looked at Bearded Ladies the other day and I can see mm -hmm. myself floundering. It's a series of short stories, yes, each yes. one with a very different voice. And mm -hmm. I can see myself trying on one voice after another. And Lillian's story, which was my mm. first published novel, although not my first written one, uh, was mm. the place where I actually found my voice. And I found it because I thought, this isn't a real book. I'm just doing it just out of fun. And mm. I'll just do it exactly the way I want. And I wrote this book. And that was the one that won the Vogel Prize. And so yeah. to have my own voice affirmed as a voice that other people wanted to hear, a, a way of telling a story that people were interested in, that was the greatest gift that I mm. could have been given. Yeah. Um, as for I, Elizabeth MacArthur's voice, yeah, look, that, yeah, I sat up in bed in my little room here and it just actually just came to me. She wasn't hard to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't, you, unlike Peter Carey with the Gerildery letter in, in his book about Ned Kelly, you didn't, you didn't clone her letters. <laughs> no, in fact, I had to avoid them because yeah. they are a little bit um, ponderous usually. Yeah. And so I found I had to read them and then go right away and not read them for a few days before I started yeah. writing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, going back to um, Jill, Jill Kerr Conway's comment, she, she says they're very 18th century. Um, yes, I wonder what she means by that. Wouldn't it be nice to ask her what she meant by feminine intelligence and what she meant yeah. by 18th century? And I suspect she means the stereotype we have about 18th century women, those poor things, they were like us. They were human beings who wanted to have yeah. agency in their lives. They wanted to have a voice. They wanted to have some power. They had none of that. And yeah. to be left with people believing that that was, what was, that was what they accepted is very wrong. I'm sure they hated yeah. it just as much as we would. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I agree. My final question, um, Kate, would be you are writing about the past. Um, are there other writers who write about the past who you particularly admire and who you would always read? I, I'm talking about novelists who, who write about the past. Um, ah, what an interesting question. Um, uh, perhaps you're hoping that I might say Hilary Mantel. Um, well, but, I don't you know. know. I mean, you might hate her stuff. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I can't that. actually read it. I, I'm one of the few people in the world um, that I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't turn me on. Um, mm. Even though I admire it very much, I can admire it without actually wanting to read it. <laughs> if that makes yeah. any sense. <laughs> <laughs> I hope people don't say that about my book. No, she does a fabulous job. And, you know, one of the things she has done for us is to make it respectable to write this thing called historical fiction mm. because she has so transformed and brought a, a bit of history to people's consciousness in a wonderful way. I mm. cheer her on for it. Mm. Um, so people who write about the past, gosh, you know, I was hugely influenced by Patrick White, um, mm. That dates me, doesn't it? Um, who writes about the past? I mean, yep. The Tree of Man, which is about yeah. early Australia, was a very formative book. I thought, would have read that sometime in my teenage years, I think. I don't mm. quite know when it came out. Um, hugely influential to me to say, look, that Australian history, which was code word for boring when I was in primary mm. school, mm. Is actually fabulously interesting, and it was full of real live people who were mm. interesting. And I want to know more about that. Mm. Good, um, Kate. Thank you. I'm going to um, have a look at some of these questions now from from uh, from the audience. Uh, yes. Well, can we can we say audience for an online session? <laughs> um, I suppose we can. And now, um, here's a question from um, Milena, who says. Um, she really enjoyed a room made of leaves. Would you, uh, would you consider your work a historical fiction? <laughs> I mean, I think we've probably answered that already. I think we've you? probably answered that one. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Melina. Um, Go back to the beginning of the interview, and you'll hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so, Lynn 
it says, your book gives a softer version of many of the events and relationship between the settlers and the indigenous people in the settlements of Sydney and Parramatta. Do you think that this is because it's told in a female voice or do you think that our colonial Australian history is changing in the present day due to an increased knowledge about indigenous stories as more Aboriginal voices are being heard in literature, politics and the media? Yes. Um, was that softer, a softer version of the beginning what? of the question? Uh, softer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is, okay. Um, look, I hope that I'm writing a harder version in many ways of that, of that confrontation between, um, uh, you know, on the frontier. Um, John MacArthur didn't call it a war, but I most certainly would. And he didn't call it a war. Anyway, that was, that's another whole story. Um, I think it's a fabulously interesting time to be writing about these things because our culture is shifting. For the first time in really 200, 250 years, white Australia is starting to make space for the Aboriginal voice and the Aboriginal mm. reality and the Aboriginal stories to be told. It's high time. In fact, it's long overdue. Um, and that means that a white writer like myself is writing in that context and that gives me... Um, that gives me the confidence that I'm not just writing out of my own preoccupations, but I'm actually writing into a culture which is now um, kind of receptive to opening up some of those subjects that used to be sealed up in little uh, myths like, you know, the pioneer myth, um, you know, the heroic pioneer idea. And that's all been blasted apart. And that is fabulous. The fact that Indigenous writers are now, their voices are well and truly uh, out there telling wonderful stories. That is um, so much what has to happen. It's so good. Right, now the next question comes from Milena again. It says, have you thought of writing a novel based on Maria Locke, daughter ah. of Yaramundi and one of the female students in the Parramatta Orphan School? And she's li listed as the last of the Blacktown Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a, 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 a Darug woman, uh, Julia Jansen, has just written a book called Benevolence, which I think yeah. Maria Locke is, is part of that book or is somehow connected there. Look, my feeling about writing these things is that I, I feel very comfortable telling the stories of my lot, if you like, the white people, the settlers. Uh, I Every writer comes to their own point of their own sweet spot about what they're prepared to write about or what they feel entitled to write about. I don't feel entitled to write about Indigenous characters. Entitled may not be quite the right word. I'm, I would leave it for Indigenous writers to do. But Maria Locke must have been an amazing woman. And, uh, yeah, I would love to read her story. I don't want to write it, but I'd love to read it. Now, there's a, a comment here from Kim who says... I love the fake news element of the novel. John MacArthur's modern day equivalent came to mind. That's obviously <laughs> a relation, uh, a relation to, uh, relates to Trump. Uh, now, Chris says, I, I, I liken your unraveling of Elizabeth's words to peeling layer after layer from a hidden garden, revealing the jewel inside. What was the experience like for you finding this woman? Ah, yeah, that's a lovely image. You know, Michael Ondaatje says that every writer is a uh, always is a kind of archaeologist monke, and that is quite quite right. You you start with this surface, as I did with the Elizabeth MacArthur letters, and you peel them back. You get out your little paintbrush. It's it's slow, tedious work, and you dis you dis deconstruct tiny elements of of the writing. So it is like that. You know, I read the. I read the letters and I thought, okay, there were just these few moments that are interesting, like I blush, blush at my error. But then I realised there were other interesting moments that the eye had glanced over. So, for example, MacArthur went to England for three or four years, so she was alone for those years. And my feeling, my strong feeling, is that she loved it, the years when he was away. Oh, boy, she was so glad. Um, but just before he was about to come back, she'd got news that he was on the way. And she writes to a friend you can imagine my delight. Uh, no, no, she says, I, you can imagine my feelings at the return 
of Mr. MacArthur. And <laughs> thank you. you. Yeah, that was exactly what I felt. Once I started to peel back that second layer, I thought, aha, um, she and the person she was writing to probably knew exactly what her feeling was. Uh, but you could read that John MacArthur himself could read that letter and not find anything wrong with it. So it was mm. a question of constantly, yes, digging down to the next little layer through the dust. Um, now, Sally would like to know, how do you write from different points of view? Ah, well, actually, I don't. I'm not very good at that. Um, my books, I think I'm right in saying, are all uh, what Henry James called the, um, oh, I've forgotten his phrase, unifying consciousness. Jason, help me out here. I think, I think that is the phrase. I think yes. so. So everything, I, all the all the events are seen through one person's consciousness. Mm -hmm. You think I've got the right phrase? Okay. Um, I think so. I, look, <laughs> I'm no expert on Henry James. God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a great fan of Henry James, so I are adore you? everything he said about writing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I, I. I would find it quite difficult. I admire writers who can slither in and out of different kind of heads of different characters in that seamless way. I think that's a whole technical skill that as a writer I've never acquired. Um, I think perhaps because I'm interested in subjectivity, I am actually interested in the fact that everybody tells a different story. Um, it's not a coincidence that I've told two versions of um, Lillian's story and Dark Places. Lillian's mm. story is about a, a young woman who is sexually abused by her father. Dark Places is her father's story written from his point of view. So I think all through my books I can see that I'm fascinated by this idea of the sort of Rashomon kind of idea. There can be many, many different versions of, of a story um, and they can, all, they can all be quite strong. But if you have a book where you are in a lot of people's heads, then you're much more, you know, godlike, omniscient kind of, I know what everybody's thinking, I'm going to just tell the reader what they're thinking. That's, mm. that's, that doesn't seem to be what I do. Mm. Um, now, Peter has a question. He's, um, Kate, how many other amazing women are hidden away in Aust our Australian <laughs> history who need their stories told? Do you oh. have any that come to mind? You're going to be very busy if you're going to tell them all. <laughs> Look, there would be millions, literally millions. Um, yeah, I think everybody should, you know, everybody has grandmothers and mothers, uh, even at that recent uh, distance of history. Those stories get lost too. I mean, I've told my mother's story. She was, and, and when, when I was writing it, and I said, oh, I'm writing a book about my mother, people would say, well, what did she do that was so special? And I'd say, well, she didn't do anything terribly special, but she was she was representative of a generation of women who went through an amazing kind of uh, time in history, blah, blah, blah. So it's like every one of those unsung women should have their story told. And while one's grandmother is still alive, one should ask them for their stories. Uh, and early colonial history, um, most of them have vanished. That's the problem. Uh, the educated ones left these starchy little letters like Elizabeth MacArthur. The uneducated ones usually didn't leave any letters or when they did, uh, they're interesting, but they're, they're very uninformative about what the people were. Women's lives have disappeared even more than working class men's lives have disappeared. And that's saying something. Uh, when you even go looking for women, of course, they're hard to find because we changed our names or they changed their names. So, you know, it's hard work. So anything you can do, to dig them up and honour them is to be applauded. Uh, now, Kim Kim has, has written the question and says, as soon as Smasher Sullivan's name was mentioned, <laughs> a vision of Tim Minchin hopping around, <laughs> Elizabeth MacArthur and early Sydney, Sydney town springs to mind. Uh, do you think that um, this, this book will be adapted for the screen? Oh, gosh, I hadn't thought of that. But, yeah, gee, Tim mentioned, wasn't he fabulous in the play? Wasn't he fabulous? Um, well, I would love that if it could be done as well as, I mean, I'm a very lucky author because The Secret River, which is a book very close to my heart, was adapted first uh, for the for a play, as a play, 
um, and secondly for a TV miniseries, and they're both terrific in their different ways. Uh, you know, most writers hate to be adapted for other media. I've been extremely well served, so I would be thrilled if someone could do as good a job for Mrs MacArthur and perhaps for Mr Dawes as well. Um, now, there's a couple of questions about um, Hilary Mantel. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Jan, Jan says, what is it about Hilary Mantel's style you find <laughs> difficult? Uh, she says, I, I wrestled with Wolf, Wolf Hall to begin with, but then, then got into the zone. And Thomas says, if not Hilary Mantel, what fiction do you read and or take inspiration from? Uh, mm -hmm. He would be so fascinated to know. Okay, Hilary Mantel, yes, I shouldn't have. Um, look, maybe I should have persisted. Maybe, maybe you have told me that I should persist. On page 50 or so of, I think it's Wolf Hall, there's a very long description of something like a, a Turkish tapestry hanging on the wall. It goes on for about a page, and that was the point at which I thought, ah, she should have killed that darling, you know, the, the truism about, <laughs> about writing. Uh, mm -hmm. She found it in research. I've been there myself. You find it in research. You can't bear to let it go. But it suddenly shouts, look what I found, you know, uh, rather than somehow foregrounding the people. But maybe I didn't persist long enough. And I do honour Hilary Mantel. Don't think for a moment that I'm criticising her. As for what I read, you know, I now find it quite difficult to read fiction because I can't read it unselfconsciously. Um, I'm always thinking, oh, look what they did there, or can I can I use that device that they've used there, or oh, no, I, I don't think that's very good there. So it's really hard for me to just submerge in that lovely warm bath way that I used to. So I read a lot of non-fiction. Um, I've just read, well, I've just read Catherine Murphy's fabulous quarterly essay about the pandemic. Um, before that, I read a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which is fascinating about such things as fake news and why we believe what we believe. Okay, so we've got the, we've got the easy question last, Kate. <laughs> what is my favourite colour? I know. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, uh, Susan has asked this, do you have a definition of feminism? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I believe it to be a strive for equality that younger women will argue me down. Huh. Well, yeah, sure, it's a really you have, about a, minute, you have about a minute for that. Mm, yeah, look, um, I'm not sure about equality, but I think equality, equality of opportunity is what I would say. Feminism is equality of opportunity uh, between men and women, which doesn't necessarily mean doing the same things or doing them in the same way, but to have equal freedom to do any of the things that your psyche impels you to do, whether that's go out and be a career woman, stay at home and mind the kids, that they both should be equally, and all the things in between, should be equally possible and equally honourable and honoured. That's, that's a pretty good place at which to end this <laughs> session. Um, Kate, thank you very much for talking to us about A, a, a Room Made of Leaves. It's a wonderful novel. Um, uh, it, now, people who are watching this, if you want to buy the book, if you're in Albury, um, you can get it from Dimmock's of Albury and they will deliver it free if you're in Albury or um, in the local area, there might be a small charge, but obviously anybody else can get the book at one of the many um, bookshops around the, the place that are doing click and collect if you're in Victoria, if you're lucky enough to be somewhere where you can wander down to your local bookshop and actually buy it. I think it's a very good idea if you haven't done so already. Um, if you want to check out what is coming up next, you can go to writearoundthemurray.org.au to see what's on after this session and what is on tomorrow. Just remains for me to say, Kate, thank you. It's a wonderful book. It gave me huge enjoyment to read. Um, and I'm looking forward to your next one, whatever that may be. <laughs> thank you so much, Jason. And thank you for all of you for um tuning in and thank you to Right Around the Murray for giving me this opportunity. Thanks you thank you. Thanks to you all.